they changed name, but it was the Manchester United of Jewish Defoyer. <laughs> and as you see, uh, the kid below uh, gave a prize to whom guess who he is. And the other round thing is the father. And the kid is a specialist in rolling. Neymar. Don't hold on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Neymar's father played for Manchester of Brazil. Okay, so let's start <laughs> now with the main hero, because Neymar is a fake. <laughs> but, <laughs> now. So Vortis is only a tiny part of James' interests. But I'm happy that uh, among this variety of interests, Vortis are highlighted in his webpage. And I encourage everybody to take a look in uh, the things that he puts, there's a lot of pictures of the bifurcations in uh, the paper that was mentioned here. That was this paper, I think it was 2001 or 2003. And that's the, the equation that uh, people worked a lot for uh, picking up on, on the talk by, by, by Milo. Uh, the background here is constant vorticity background. So you don't have that complicated omega evolving thing. It's com completely only the point vortices. And you don't have the Coriolis force. So it's much simpler. The interesting thing is that the sum of the vorticities don't have to vanish. And that when they vanish, then the background vorticity is zero. But when they don't vanish, uh, but it doesn't change. And the original paper was mentioned here was by Bog Bogomolov. So let me uh, describe a little bit uh, a few of the papers that James did. I think the, the re correct me if I'm wrong, please. So the, the first paper opens this research program and, and James is really a, uh, the wizard on, on the bifurcations related to, to group invariants, to, to, to group symmetries. Then there is uh, a nice paper, and then he discusses the, the vortex street. Uh, for those that are not uh, uh, acquainted with, once you have an obstacle and there is a flow behind the obstacle, you get a street of opposite vortices and they, they keep going. So that paper, uh, I think that was the one that was mentioned perhaps, mm -hmm. 2011. It's uh, very, very technical in the sense that uh, there's a lot of uh, geometric mechanics embodied in the way you choose the, the basis. And choosing bases was, as we saw yesterday and the day before, uh, Choosing good bases for problems uh, was, is part of the game in, in geometric mechanics. Say that was Laurent Pulse. Please go ahead. That was my student. That was Laurent Pulse. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> and also for him. <laughs> All right. And this is a novelty, this paper here. I, I think it should be looked more, you know, read by people because you include sources and things. I think the only person that I remember did, was doing that was Ernesto Lacomba, but unfortunately he's not with us anymore. And there's an, an optical analogous here. Then uh, there are two more papers, and I think there will be much, 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 much more in the, in the future, I hope. So uh, for, for the students here, uh, this is more or less the, I'll leave this for a few minutes, uh, basic information on, on vortices. And the type of vortices that we'll discuss in this talk, they are like, we call them vortex pairs or, or dipoles. Just two vortices with opposite circulations. Uh, in the plane, what happens is that one vortex wants the other one to rotate around him this way. And the other vortex want to do the, op the other thing. 
So as a result, they go on a straight line, both of them. And they go very fast as they get close together. And in many foods, uh, sort of the same thing is happening. You replace, when they're very close together, straight lines by geodesics. And that was a conjecture by Kimura, a Japanese uh, fluid mechan mechanicist, that is half, I would say it's 95% proved, but the technical things are, are an issue for mathematicians, not for physicists and nobody else. But, uh, <laughs> but there, there are details that uh, we need lawyers to help us. The, the, you know, lawyers like Tudor to help us with uh, hard analysis to, to make things really, you know, kosher. Anyway. Uh, don't bother too much about the plan of the talk because I never follow the plan of the talk. Anyway, but I just put the slide. And when it's about time to finish, I will just go forward to the end and that will be it. So we're going to stop 10 minutes before the hour. Okay, so let me start with uh, motivation. So why people are interested in physics uh, experiments in point vortices right now? That started with liquid helium and superfluidity, and now they're doing Bose-Einstein. Bose-Einstein are uh, sort of gases, diluted, that uh, one can uh, think that they're as kind of a united big thing that obeys a collective quantum uh, mechanical thing. And the interesting thing is that uh, you can put vortices in this sort of fluid. And those vortices more or less follow the equations that you get from hydrodynamics. And I think this was the first experiment in which they found a vortex pair of opposite vortices on a Bose-Einstein condensate. Before, they usually found vortices with the sort of same, and they were like going around and around uh, in circles around them. So, but now, uh, those experiments have been repeated by other groups. But I think it was 2010, the first experiment. I would like to, I put this slide yesterday uh, with a, on a discussion with Pascal. Because this picture looks very much like his picture, right? Compare the two pictures. So we are, we are agreeing to disagree a little bit that if this is a coincidence or not a coincidence. And that reminds me of uh, what Holger mentioned in the talk uh, of Pascal. Are we imposing things when, when we, we, we go? want to have analogies. I think everything is like a tip of an iceberg. There should be analogies to somebody to, to find. So let me just explain what is this. So this is a work by Claude Waldo Hagazu. Uh, he's now one of the uh, middle uh, career mathematicians in Brazil that is doing very strong research. He's a Hamiltonian guy as well. And he liked to do a Desire for a bit, and he had a student that worked on, on the hyperbolic geometry. So you are doing vortices here on the Bose surface. The Bose surface is genus two surface where the fundamental domain is a regular octagon. That's and that's a classical uh, Riemann surface with many symmetries, many many symmetries. I think that's the one that has most symmetries probably. And uh, what you see here are the level lines of the Robin function. So let me just mention uh, very briefly, because this is not the focus of, of my talk, what's the Robin function. There is also a Batman function, but this is just the Robin <laughs> function. Okay. The Robin function is you take the green function that was mentioned in the last talk, of the Laplace Beltrami operator. And then you subtract, depending on how you normalize, 
the log of the distance between those points. Then you take the limit when S1 tends to S2 equals S. And what's left is the Robin function. And that Robin function governs the motion of a single vortex, just one vortex on a Riemann surface. So Clodoaldo made that, uh, whoop, let me go back, uh, found that picture. So those, these are the, the face portrait of the one vortex on the hyperbolic plane. Very similar to Pascal. There should be a reason. Now let's go back to that, to that equation. How does this equation change when we, we have a surface which is not a spherical anymore? Say, a triaxial ellipsoid or a surface of revolution. So for those that had a background, a little background on uh, hydrodynamics, we know that in the plane, ideal hydrodynamics is very well behaved under conformal transformations. So this is another thing which is a miracle. Conformal transformations are everywhere. As we saw uh, on Pascal talk, there's a conformal transformation from the retina to the V1 region, even in biology, uh, in plants. In, uh, so you know, conformal mapping, I think, it should be in the curriculum of every undergrad student. And I'm trying to force that in Juiz de Fora because they don't have, strangely enough, complex uh, functions for, for even the math students. I mean, which is crazy. But that's so the, the story starts in 1980 with a physicist called David Halley. He published a paper in the Journal of Mathematical Physics, and he proposes those equations where H is the conformal factor here in the, how you say, you're mapping the surface or a piece of the surface to the plane. The surface has to be either with the topology of the plane or with the topology of the sphere to, for this to be valid. But at least for plane or genus zero, those are the equations. There is a caveat in those equations that, uh, sorry, I'll go back. Uh, those equations are only valid if the sum of the vorticities are zero. So, uh, in a work I, I did a few years ago with my colleague Stefanella Boato, we found out that there is a non-local term that depends on the whole surface to be added when the uh, vo total vorticity of those vortices is non-zero. So even though uh, the background has uniform vorticity, this uniform vorticity uh, sort of uh, reacts because of the sum of the vortices are not zero and, and gives this extra term that I will not bother to, to discuss in this talk because we're doing a pair of opposite vortices in the rest of the talk. So basically, we're okay. Those are the references of uh, our works. Those are in preparation. And one of them just appeared in the Journal of Geometric Mechanics. I think it was the last issue. I'll show it in, in a bit. Now, let's think now about using the sphere instead of the plane. There's a lot of advantages on the sphere. Because uh, to, to put things on the plane, you need stereographic projection, which sort of, sort of for the Euclidean eye, makes things far away very big. So if you are in the round sphere, everything is equal to everything. And also the symplectic uh, integrators are very well adapted to do things on the sphere. So we are going to do things here.
And this product also appeared in other talks, right? So what we want is to, to have a correspondence between the original surface, which is with a non-Euclid, non-constant non, uh, curvature geometry, and transport to the sphere. And we go, we're going to do that by using conformal mapping. OK? So far, so good? And when we do that, we use the sphere to represent the dynamics. The equations are very nice, because you have just the, the area form of the sphere, the first sphere, the second sphere, and the conformal factors at those points. So those are the area forms of each of, the, of them, which is equivalent of the area form here. And the Hamiltonian is just the usual term. I'm normalizing things. Don't worry about the, the, the things. And then you have these two other terms, which are new, in the sense that they depend of, of having a non-constant conformal factor. OK? Remember that the conformal factor is here. Except that in, instead of pu putting dz2, we are we putting here the area form of the sphere. Okay. And we end up with this nice system of, of equations. So let's think abstractly for a bit. Our original surface can be a very abstract ribbon surface with a metric. And in this representation, it's like what the Russians like. They, ha they want to run things concrete. In this representation, we are on a geometric sphere with those correction factors. So we're going to work and take advantage of the geometric sphere. I'd like to hear an objection from the public for those equations, but I didn't hear. When I talk about the conformal factor from a surface to the sphere, Tubo might say, hey, wait a minute. There are six parameter family of them. Because you, you know, a conformal map to the sphere is defined up to a maybe transformation of the sphere. So the beautiful thing of this thing is that those equations are very well behaved under conformal transformations. You can check that analytically, or you can check that visually. A Möbius map on the sphere is something very strange. But if you put the sphere in some strange place, the conformal map will appear like a rotation and a scaling. So that's sort of a geometric uh, intuition of why this is well behaved under conformal mapping. And we can take advantage of this disadvantage by saying, suppose I have a pair of vortices which is in equilibrium somehow. By doing a conformal transformation, you can put this equilibrium as antipodal equilibrium. Just by doing this transformation, you can pretend that your vortices in the spherical representation are in antipodal positions, and even in the south and north poles. And that will help doing the linearization, if you wish. So, so the, this set of equations, I claim, is there's a lot of little things to be done with that. And you, we can have a few properties. And the main property that I like to stress is this one here. That if your ori original surface sigma has antipodal symmetries, like the ellipsoid, you end up with a center manifold of antipodal points in the surface or in the sphere. Because if you have a, a surface with antipodal symmetry, symmetry there will be a unique conformal map that takes that surface to the sphere that will send the antipodal vertices, like the vertices of the ellipsoid, except for uh, 
a rotation to the sphere. So why, for surfaces with antipodal symmetry, antipodal points will move, but they will keep antipodal? So that will be the first exercise that I'll give a chocolate in the end of the talk. And I'll ask Richard to start distributing the, the papers with me. So exercise one, look at those equations <laughs> and prove that simple result. You have to help me. Oh, yeah, I will. <laughs> you are supposed to stare at those equations <laughs> and prove this result. Are you telling us what age is? Or no? huh? Are you telling us what age is? Or no? What? For any age? For age that comes from a surface with antipodal symmetry. And I give you a hint. On the mug. Can you pass around? The hint is What would be the sign that I would, should put here when the surface has antipodal symmetry? From that, oh, I'm, I'm giving the solution for you. <laughs> From that, the second equation reproduces the first equation if you start with antipodal points. But you can make it a uh, sort of longer argument, but still. There'll be other exercises. This is just, <laughs> just a warm-up. So just pay attention to these equations. I think there's much more to, but let's think. Let, we're going to confine ourselves in this talk with surfaces with antipodal symmetry, especially the triaxial ellipse. But you could do as well surfaces of revolution. I'll give an example. Or a crazy surface. But even a crazy surface, you can map on a round sphere and use this con crazy conformal factor. Mm -hmm. One good thing that happens is that if you put an equilibria by doing a conformal, uh, an amoebis transformation of the sphere in antipodal positions, a good thing is that that first term will vanish. And that will help you to do the linearization. And so on. So I'm going to jump to this. This was the proof. Now, in general, now there's very, very, very uh, complete uh, work on doing conformal mappings from surfaces to sort of standard manifolds, like the sphere or, or some uh, special uh, representative. So in practice, I think it's not hard to implement this H numerically, and then apply some uh, symplectic uh, integrator to it. So this is another exercise that one could do. For instance, I, I showed this picture in Russia, uh, and they liked it. Uh, and Luis was there. So there, a dialyzed surface would be you have a, a piece of a sphere, a small piece of another sphere, and then you complete by a straight line. So it's not hard to find a conformal map. Uh, you know, a student can do it from this to the round sphere and play the game. But no matter how crazy is your surface of revolution, what we found is that if you put antipodal vortices on the poles, this configuration is going to be stable in this four-dimensional space, which is kind of surprising. And we'll see that uh, 
for uh, a surface of uh, antipodal symmetry, that depends. It's much more complicated. But there'll be, we'll, we'll go into that. So this is the main exercise of this talk. We're going to start now the triaxial ellipsoid. Those formulas, uh, for instance, in the book by Bolsonov and Fomenko, the first uh, metric is the metric on the triaxial ellipsoid. The second metric, is strange, is the metric on the round sphere. Completely round, but the, the metric looks crazy. But it's the metric of the round sphere. And in, the, in this book, I explain how you construct both metrics. But if you stare at, uh, at them, you see that you have something nice here, something nice here. And you like to define the conformal factor between the ellipsoid to the sphere. But just by dividing this by this and having this conform a factor. But you can only do that if this part here and this part here are transformed on a common uniformizing set of new variables. Are, are you keeping up with me? So before continuing, I'll give you like two or three minutes if you want to copy those formulas. And I stop to drink water. And while you copy this formula, you'll see that those metrics are in a very nice form, which are called the Liouville form. Except for this factor here, you see they are separated. And that separation allows us to find uniformizing coordinates without needing to, I don't see people copying. I don't, you guys don't want to do the exercise? <laughs> <laughs> too bad. <laughs> huh? I, 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 I. Huh? Great question. That's the main question. What are the eyes meaning? Okay, we go. The, there is one metric with, I mean, there's, the metric is the metric of the sphere. So this is many representations. That's many representations of the round, of the round metric. Okay. And you have complete freedom mm -hmm. to choose I1, I2, and I3. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you asked this question. why it looks like it's the wrong signature. Hmm? The yeah, but you see, th those numbers, are they, they compensate. Because there is, there is a relation that I forgot to say, that lambda 1 can only go from A to B. And lambda 2 can only go from B to C. What about the mu? Same. The mu 1 can only go from I1 to I2. And mu 2 can only go from... I2 to I3, and then the signature becomes OK. Mm -hmm. the, other thing that, the other thing that you look is that they're almost the same things, except that in the top, you have an extra stuff. So is I1 greater than I2 greater than I3? Yes. On the contrary, I1 is less than I2. Uh, OK. I, I got to put here. I1 less than I2 less than I3, and the first uh, mu lives here, the second lives here, and equivalent for, for the ellipsoid. Okay? Now, you, you can guess what happens when they, they are equal. When lambda 1 equals lambda 2 equals B, what happens? Those that have a little bit of uh, acquaintance with uh, differential geometry will like this picture. The umbilics of the ellipsoid correspond to the points where 
lambda 1 equals lambda 2 equals b. And on the sphere, we are creating fake umbilics that they are artifacts of their coordinates. However, I want to draw the, 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 the sphere, but I claim that the topology of the level lines of the, of the coordinates on the sphere, the topology is this completely the same. So the only question that remains is how you make the correspondence between lambda 1 to mu 1 and lambda 2 to mu 2 so that that correspondence becomes a conformal mapping. Once you do that, you're done. You are home free to follow the, the rest of the story. You can do that as long as you have a same rectangle. And how you get the same rectangle? Go back here. The, the size of the rectangle is the integral of the, for instance, of the one side of the rectangle for the metric on the uh, ellipsoid is the integral of the square root of lambda 1 divided by that th those things, d lambda, d lambda 1 between a and b. And that's an elliptic integral of the third kind. Same with the second term. Same with the other story with the other one. You integrate and that's an elliptic integral of the first kind. And you force the i1, i2, and i3 to be chosen in such a way that you get a common rectangle. Once you do that, the correspondence is completely well done. So i1, i2, and i3, they are functions of a, b, and c. Right? So you can, if you want, do the calculations and just give me the formulas in the end of it. So, but I, I'll give you a glimpse here. So that's uh, the prize. And well, the other part of the prize is showing, for instance, that the conformal factor at the umbilic is given by this formula. And where in this formula, the, the I1, I2, and I3 are functions of A, B, and C because you have to have a common rectangle. So far for that. So keep an eye, uh, uh, notice that at the umbilic, you have a zero divided by zero limit because lambda 2 equals lambda 1 and mu 2 equals to mu 1. So you have to do a, a, a lot of L'Hopital rules and some tricks. It's on our paper. So one other thing that uh, calls our attention uh, while doing that is that you can only uniformize on an octant. And why does this glue together well for the whole sphere? I think this is the miracle of uh, complex analysis. You have Schwartz reflection things, and one of the corners of the rectangle, it's open by from 90 to say, 180 degrees when you do the conformal map. And that becomes the umbilic. So if you try to, to make a conformal map of the ellipsoid to the plane, you're going to have points in which the area form diverges. Same with the ellipsoid. But the wonderful thing that when, when do one to the other is that those divergences, they cancel each other. That's the miracle of, uh, of uh, how you say, algebraic geometry or, I don't know, complex uh, functions. You know, you don't have to do anything. The, the singularities are the same type. They cancel each other and you have everything is smooth. I don't have to hide Tudor as a lawyer in analysis to prove me right. You know, it's... Uh, if, you, if you don't agree, do that. And we'll call the VR to, you know, how the referees in the soccer they do. <laughs> yeah. But I think this, this is okay. So, in the end, how you get I1, I2, and I3 as a function of A, B, and C? You end up, 
and I'm going to do some historical comments here, you end up with a very famous equation that the k's are the elliptic integrals of the first kind. The little k's are related to, to the unknown coefficients, i1, i2, and i3. The other side, which is r, is some function of a, b, and c of the ellipsoid that comes from these elliptic integrals of the third kind that I mentioned before. And what I call the attention is that this equation is well known and is invertible. I just found it by chance by looking at, uh, I'll, I'll, show, I'll talk about this uh, later. Um, so uh, this is what I already mentioned, that uh, once you, you use the middle square uh, to intervene between the ellipsoid and the sphere, you end up with a smooth conformal map. And that's what happens if you try to do in the plane. You get a double covering of the plane by an elliptic function. That's for the sphere. That's the Pierce uh, thing. And you see that it deforms around the poles. And there's some historical note on the book by Felix Klein that he says, where he says, uh, for instance, the ellipsoid may be conformally represented by virtue of known investigations on a sphere. I tried to look uh, what were these known investigations. We have very obscure papers uh, that I never could understand. So we, when we tried to start this project, we said, let's start from scratch and don't look at the old papers. And that's what we, I think what we did is probably equivalent from uh, those guys did before. <coughs> and a historical note is that also Riemann uh, had worked on, uh, on that quotient between K and K, this is just historical notes. And also Jacobi. So it's uh, something well known. And this is about the geodesics on the ellipsoid. So we implemented those equations on the triaxial ellipsoid. And that is in this journal of geometric mechanics. Think when the vortices get close together, they really mimic the geodesics. So that validates sort of numerically and more or less theoretically the, the procedure. And what's interesting is that although the geodesic system on the triaxial ellipsoid is integral, the vortex problem is non-integral. It's sort of KAM perturbation of it. But everything that I'm saying now must be better worked out. So that's the paper. So is there any questions from now? Uh, I will only work for 10 more minutes to, to finish the talk. So about the, the linearization, uh, I will go very fast to the end of the talk. The only thing that you need is to expand the conformal factors at the singularity. So if you have a pair of op opposite vortices, Say so you can map it them as uh, antipodal by choosing the conformal map uh, and the MUBIS adaptation of it. And they only need those coefficients, H1, P1, Q1, and H2, P2, and Q2. And in fact, you only need the ratio of P1 divided by H1 and Q1 divided by H1 and the other ones. When you have surfaces with antipodal symmetry, actually those expansions are the same. Right? Because. Yeah, that's the second part of the talk. Okay? I'm going to uh, state a theorem and I'm going to explain that table. All right? So, what I'm claiming is that you only need this information to build the linearization matrix. So, there's a lot of blah, blah, blah. And in general, the linearization matrix looks like that. You can compute the. You can compute the characteristic polynomial, it's a bi-quadratic, and so forth and so on. Let's jump to further away, because there's a lot of... Uh, for surface of antipodal symmetry, that matrix gets a little bit uh, simplified. You have those coefficients here. You find uh, uh, 
eigenspaces, because if you have antipodal symmetry, our intuition is that there will be a two-dimensional thing related to that invariant submanifold and the transverse thing, and you can compute the eigenvalues. And so out of that, you get this theorem. The theorem says the following. I'm going to erase here. I'm near the end of the talk. Let's, let's use this board. So, remember, the expansion, the quadratic expansion of the conformal factor is h. I'm going to put some h because they're, they're, they're the same. Mas plus one half of p1 x1 square plus one half of q1 y1 square. What I'm doing is that you have the sphere. At the north pole, you put the xy plane. In the south pole, you put another plane. But since the, you have antipodal symmetry, the surface looks the same, so you just need one edge. And in this formula, uh, when you have p prime and q prime, so I can erase these things here. p prime is p divided by h, and q prime is q divided by h. And that's the result. And I, I have similar results uh, for surface of revolution and similar results for, I mean, general results for a crazy uh, surface. So for the central manifold, if the, this product is positive, we have a center. This is very reasonable because after all, the conformal factor H is the Hamiltonian for the central manifold. So if the sign is negative, we will have a saddle. What is new is the information about the transverse subspace in the other direction, in the other plane. You have just to put one minus p primes and one minus q prime. And then if it's positive, you have stability, a center in that thing, so you have a center center. So you can have center center, you can have uh, saddle saddle, or center saddle. That's what you, you can get. And let's now uh, finish by explaining this table. In this table, uh, I just got this table two days ago. I was, you know, really pressing my... I, I had a few of numbers that they, they had from other papers, but I, I said, I want you guys to... No sleep for two days, but I want this by today. And I got it two days ago. I didn't have time really to, to look at them in detail, but you can see that it makes sense. In the first three columns, you have choices of A, B, and C. So I told them, take C always equals to 1. And take A less than B less than C going to 10%. So that uh, you more or less looking at all possible ellipsoids. More or less, morally speaking, you know. You're sort of dis discretizing the space of ellipsoids in a very crazy way. Because, after all, the size doesn't matter too much, only the, f the shape. So you have many possibilities, like 36 of them, by these choices. And the other three columns are I1, I2, and I3, that are the choices that you have to make so that their rectangles become the same. So I1, I2, and I3 are functions of A, B, and C. And they are given by solving that master equation. That I, 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 that's the main task. And finally, I, I won't have the time to show, there are formulas for the Q's and Q's and the H that you can derive by really working hard in the case of the triaxial ellipsoid. That's the hard part of the work. We're going to submit it soon. I won't show it here. And in the end, you get these last six columns. If you stare at the, uh, the P's and the Q's for the point A, is the, the uh, smaller axis. 
they are all positive. So if they are all positive, you are on a minimum, right? Of the conformal factor function, right? Because you have a quadratic expansion, right? Mm -hmm. So you are in a minimum. So they are positive, but they are less than what? If you look at those guys here, they're all, both columns are less than one, right? And if you look at that, at that theorem, you take one minus P and one minus Q, they're also positive. So you have the case of center, center, right? If you look at the last columns, two columns here, all the coefficients are negative. But the product is positive. So you are in a maximum of the conformal factor, right? Function. Again, in the center manifold, you have stability. But also, when you make one minus and one minus, you get positives. And the product is positive. So the only interesting one is for the B in the middle. One is positive, and the other row is of negatives. That means a saddle in uh, the center manifold. Good. That sort of looks something familiar that you draw in the sphere. What is something that everybody in geometric mechanics learns? In, in <laughs> James can tell us. Le the rigid body momentum. Unfortunately, I was very, dis I mean, life sometimes is boring. <laughs> I see, we have 10 special points. We have the six endpoints, and you have the four umbilics. I wanted to see combinations of strange things that sometimes the umbilics will be kind of uh, equilibrium. Didn't happen, maybe. So what happens is if you put two vortices, opposite vortices in the umbilics, the pair will circulate and, and go to the other umbilic and keep going like this. Could be this way or that way, depending on uh, the, the, the values of which is bigger or whatever, but that's what is going to happen. So the picture looks a little bit like the, the, the picture in the momentum sphere. But I, I sort of felt sad about that. So, questions? <laughs> I, I think it's uh, almost enough. Let's just jump to, to the end of the talk. I, I'll jump to the end. Because I, I could take some, so you can do this exercise. There's some, some stuff. I did some calculations just to, to mention on the vortex bigger. What's the vortex bigger? You take the elliptic uh, bigger in the plane, and you put vortices on them. But you have the two sides. And you can play the game. It's the limit of the triaxial ellipsoid when the, set, the axis A goes to zero. And you will have the same pattern. But I did the calculation for you. <laughs>